Uh, so yeah, so my name's Scott. Um, so I'm going to be just delivering a little talk about my experience in uh, QA um, and my time in both manual and automated testing. Um, so quality assurance, software testing, test engineering, whatever you may have heard it before, I think we can all pretty much agree that testing our software to some extent is probably a positive thing. Yes? <laughs> yes, good. It's uh, good. At least I can still validate that I have a job. This is good. Um, but unfortunately, there are a number of misconceptions around software testing and about the engineers who are involved in it as well. I'd like to draw on some of these today and discuss them and put a little bit of a new spin on the subject as well. And I think I can safely say uh, that it's quite unique and that no one has really attempted this before. So we're in uncharted waters, so you might have to bear with me a couple of times. Uh, but a little bit of background about me. So I've been a QA for seven years now across various uh, sizes of company and different genres of technology. So I started out at Cisco, working on their teleconferencing uh, networking equipment. Uh, then moved on to Barclays, working on their Box FX trading platform. Um, then on to Uview, uh, where I worked on the set-top box, so the, basically BT's equivalent of the Skybox. Um, and then eventually was working on a collaboration with Sony on their first Android TV as well. And currently, as Rory said, I am the lead and only test. Um, I like to call myself head of test, but I'm actually head of no. Uh, <laughs> yet, we are growing. No, we're just, we're just uh, up for a next round of funding, so if anyone wants to join. But um, yeah, so I, I have a very interesting view into all realms of test right now, uh, especially working alongside seven developers. It can get a little bit interesting. Um, but and through working through all these different companies, I feel it's given me an interesting perspective into all sorts of testing across the board. Um, but alongside this, I have had a second rather different career um, doing this. a second career at making annoying noises. Uh, I often combine the two in the workplace, uh, much to the annoyance of my colleagues. <laughs> um, but, uh, sorry, just going to scroll down a little bit here. Uh, and that's not working. That's interesting. No, my notes. Sorry. Plumbing tech. Everything, everything. Why does it die when you're having to demo it? It's the curse of the test engineer, I swear. Whenever you want to find a bug, we call it the Heisen bug, where it's only there when the tester's looking at it. If anyone else looks at it, it's gone. Uh, and, oh, oh, it's on the other screen. Oh, thank you. There we go. I'll use that. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so, um, I can't remember where I am now. What's the next one? Okay, yes. Um, there's, so, yeah, I, 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 what I've been finding over the years, though, combining these two careers, is that... I'm using elements of each in each other to learn a bit more about. I'm using elements of my test engineering to learn more about my beatboxing, and I'm learning more about the kind of the creative side of my career um, to learn more about test engineering as well. And there's a great quote that uh, this was actually at the top of someone's CV uh, when they interviewed them. Normally, I hate really pithy quotes at the top of a CV, uh, but this one's really stuck with me. Um, so to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. And it's from a little-known scientist called Albert Einstein. Um, but 
And for me, this, this really struck a chord, and, and I view this as a way of taking a new view on something is always something a test engineer should be doing. And, and it really helps you learn a lot more about your products if you view it in a different way. Um, so yes, this, so this is basically going to be the talk. I am going to talk about my experience with manual and automated testing through the lens of human beatbox. And you'll be surprised, it's a surprisingly good analogy. Um, so let's start by having a look at manual testing. So I've, uh, this is where I started out at Cisco. I didn't know how to code or, or write any, any sort of software. I did a little bit of C at university, but I hated it. Um, for a show of hands, anyone who's ever worked with C? Do you like it? No. no. <laughs> I think that's fair. Um, but yeah, so manual testing, I feel, is a lot like solo beatboxing. Um, it's, it's an excellent analog, in fact. So I have the basic tools which allow me to carry out testing. In this case, it's my lips. <laughs> um, and my breath and my voice. Uh, I have some basic training which allows me to use these tools in an effective way. So rather than just some sort of <laughs> mess coming out, I can make these individually defined sounds. And I also have some other tools as well. So most, most manual testers, they're not, it, not just using themselves, they'll have some sort of software tools, whether it's just defect tracking or whether it's code management, release management, they'll always have something that they rely on, some sort of software. And the analog for this is, I'm using my microphone and amplifier. Without it, the beatboxing still sounds good, it's still effective. But the difference it makes is when I just make a random fart noise, on a microphone that sounds like this. So, it really does allow me to, to, to do a lot more. Um, however, there are a number of, oh, missed that one. Um, there are a number of uh, gross misconceptions when it comes around to manual testing. So if I was to just um, ask anybody in the room, just shout out. So if I was to say, like, what are the negative points of manually testing so software? What would you say? Slow. Slow? Time consuming? User error. User error. Yeah, I mean, we've hit on all the big ones already. It's it can be expensive, slow, boring, um, prone to fallibility. Um, I would argue though that this is manual test that's implemented poorly. Um, the short term cost can actually be a lot lower. Um, getting a, a user up to speed is usually a lot of, for your product is a lot quicker usually than having to write some sort of infrastructure around it to be testing it. Um, not restricted by conventional methods, to go back to the beatboxing technology, uh, sorry, analogy, uh, I don't need a drum kit to make drum noises. I, can, I don't need a synthesizer to make some synth. Um, I don't need one of these. Um, <laughs> it's always a favorite, that one. Um, decisions can be made quickly and flexibly. A manual tester can context switch very, very fast to to work on what they're needed, whether it's a new feature or a critical issue that a user has spotted, they're able to jump on that a lot quicker uh, and test it rigorously than automated processes across the board. And similarly with beatboxing, if I want to switch from a rock beat to techno, I can do that instantly. Um, and manual testers often have to come up with creative solutions to problems as well. Uh, and again, the analogy I like to use with this with beatboxing is singing and beatboxing at the same time. Uh, normally it would be impossible, but if you use a little bit of trickery, it could be done. If your mother only knew... Together. If your mother only knew... If your mother only knew... So, you see, it's a good analogy, right? It gets there. <laughs> Um, but unfortunately, there are downsides to solely relying on manual testing, some of which we have hit on upon already. Um, there is a single point of failure. Uh, if my microphone suddenly decides to cut out while I'm... then you're not going to get anything. It's going to be completely useless. Um, there's limited scope. Much as I would want to, uh, I cannot perform Stravinsky's Rite of Spring on this microphone. Um, it is a physical impossibility. Uh, I would need some sort of help or assistance or other people to be able to do that. Fatigue, eventually I have to take a breath. <laughs> Similarly, with manual testing, it can get a bit wearisome. And it's not perfectly reproducible. I don't have control over my environment when I'm testing manually. Uh, I can't guarantee every time that I'm using exactly the same scenario and settings. 
Um, similarly with beatboxing. It might sound similar, but if you were to analyze those two waveforms, they would look completely different. There'd be different tempos, different frequencies involved there. I can't accurately get it exactly the same every single time. Um, so even with modern cloud-based SaaS systems like Aperio, though, it's, it's still important uh, to, do, to do a lot of manual testing. Um, exploratory testing still has its place. If you anything with user experience or trialist testing, it's still going to need some decent, well-informed, well-trained manual testers. Uh, any sort of targeted regression or ad hoc testing, again, as I said, if you need someone to context switch very quickly, um, then manual testing is the way to go. Uh, there, and there are the downsides, the dreaded regression testing. So the, the beatbox equivalent of regression testing is this. It's incredibly boring. <laughs> Uh, and at Aperio, I'm currently alone. Uh, we are looking to hire soon, but uh, for the last two years, I've been working as a loan tester. And so you need to get creative to think about solutions uh, for testing in order to maintain and improve upon a high quality standard. Uh, and as I said, with seven developers, that, is, that can be a challenge at times. Um, so a good example, uh, or should I say a bad example, of uh, manual testing being taken too far uh, at a certain financial institution, which I haven't mentioned here, uh, <laughs> for good reason, as you will see. Um, I, again, I was working on uh, an FX exchange trading platform, and to test their pricing server and the performance testing of the pricing server, uh, we would all get all the testers would get on a conference call. We'd have the lead test engineer would uh, be on the pricing server itself, ready to change your value for a particular <coughs> currency pair, and all of the test engineers would be given one of these. You can see where this is going. Um, the lead test engineer would change the price on the server after saying three, two, one, go. We would start our stopwatch, wait for the number to change on our screens, stop the stopwatch, and note the time. And we do this across the board, number of different readings, different prices, swaps, forwards, um, spot rates, and things. Uh, I actually did some statistical analysis on this for my manager at the time. And these are sub one second measurements we're talking about here. And the uh, standard deviation of the measurements was larger than the mean time itself. So it'd be half a second with a standard deviation of three quarters of a second. It was completely useless. And the excuse he kept coming back with saying, it has thrown up issues in the past, therefore we should continue to use it. And that is a very dangerous mentality to have, and you'll get very, very backlogged with a lot of unnecessary tests very quickly. Um, is it a creative solution? Yes. Um, it's certainly original. Um, it takes a lot of imagination to come up with a, a, um, a system like that. Uh, but it just goes to show that as creative as manual testers can be, sometimes there is a better option. Uh, and I've had some varied experiences with automation in my time. Um, it can be a headache getting it set up, but keeping it maintained often tends to be the biggest problem. Um, but when it's planned properly with good agile practices, uh, all teams will invariably find that it, it's, it, you're able to support a higher quality standard uh, if you have a decent automation setup. So to bring it back to the beatboxing, <laughs> before I put you all to sleep talking about testing. Um, this is going to be my analog for automated testing. So this is my loop station, and it can record everything that I put into it from my microphone, and play it back to me, exactly as it's been entered. So my regression testing from earlier, rather than now becomes as simple as that. It's great. Um, and then, if I want to expand upon this, if I want to change some parameters on it, I could change the frequency, I could change the speed if I wanted to. Um, I can even run tests in parallel. I could just keep expanding on it like this.
what I'm hopefully demonstrating here is the power of automation. Uh, it is able to amplify the skills of your manual testers to agree that they can do things that they'd never be able to do purely on their own. Um, so, I, as I said, I, as I could do here, rather than just solo beatboxing, I've got extra layers and harmonies that I can add in. Um, it can be a hell of a lot more interesting as well. Um, both in the results and the creation of your automated processes as well. Um, and what I have here though, the most important thing is I have a completely controlled environment. I know that every time that loop plays, it's going to be identical. And that is incredibly useful. Um, so through the loop station, we can even see the differences between the different styles of testing. Um, so we have, we'll start off with, start at the bottom of our test period, and we'll start off with the unit tests. So it's just testing an individual bit of code. It, like, it can even go down to like functions within the code. And you combine individual units to form components. There's our component test. Uh, then we start to put bits of code together. So we have our integration test where we can see how different bits of the code interact. And eventually you have your full system level test. And then if this works, you can start doing a performance test as well. <laughs> it's just that the, 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 the options you have with an automated test setup, a decent automated test setup, are endless. Um, it is not the magic solution to all problems, though. This is, this is the, the biggest problem that most companies face, is they think that just by enforcing or uh, forcing on their teams to create more automation, or automate all the things, um, will be the solution to all of their problems, and it's not. If you do that and you don't go in with a proper plan, you can end up having exactly the same problems uh, that we talked about earlier with manual testing. It could be expensive. You have to train these engineers to maintain the code, and if, if it's been implemented poorly and all they're doing is having to constantly update test cases, they're not adding any value. It can be slow. Um, for instance, at Aperio, we have to do a lot of tests with uploading CSV files of millions of rows. It takes time to process that. It can be boring. Uh, can I just see by a show of hands uh, who's ever had to go through, especially a Selenium man uh, automated test report that isn't just like red light, green light. Okay, we've got a couple, uh, one person in the room. The rest of you, you do not know how lucky you are. <laughs> it is the most mind-numbing thing in the world. Um, and it's also prone to fallibility as well. For the most part, it's still humans creating these test cases. If it's looking at the wrong expected result, uh, or the test case is invalid, then again, it's not adding any value. You could be getting a false positive or a false negative. Uh, but if you design your tests and test plans before writing the code, with decent agile practices, if you think, if you design your infrastructure with key, with maintainability in mind, um, and depending on your product, if you follow the design pyramid quite closely as well, lots of unit tests, fewer component tests, fewer integration tests, and system level tests, it's very hard to go wrong. Um, so onto the, the TL, TLDR bit. Um, so if there's something that I'd like you to take away from this talk, uh, the first thing would be don't underestimate your manual testers. Um, they're often the people that will know your product the best. They're using all of the features day in, day out, and looking at the way that these features interact. That's their job, or it should be their job. Um, especially from a UX perspective, I work very closely with our UX designer and product manager in the office, uh, and I'd say that around 80% of my role is, as a, as, a, as a product expert, before pen is put to paper, you try and identify the bugs before any code has even been written. Uh, and identify the problems that the developers will have as well. And with any consumer technology, I still feel that regardless of the developments that have happened in AI, anything that's designed for a human to use, a human should be looking at. Um, an example I like to use when looking for good testing skills is I have a web page, and I tell them that it has, there's two string inputs. So you can just take any two strings, and the program will return the longer of the two strings. Um, now, a lesser skilled test engineer would immediately start throwing you um, ideas of test plans. So they would say, well, how about alphanumeric strings? How about Unicode? Uh, null strings? What if they're the same length? Uh, what if I try and do some penetration testing? What if I use a different browser? And this is great. This is, this is what you want from your kind of lower test engineers. You want them to be thinking outside the box, <coughs> planning all the scenarios and how they can break something. Uh, but a great tester, the first things they'll be asking 
will be more about the software than just the functionality. It'll be about the person using it. Uh, so why would someone want to use this? How would they be using it? What value is it of? It? What value is this feature to them? Uh, and that's that. That really kind of that separates, I think, the two two different uh, types of tester that we have currently. Um, now the first of those is handled well by automated methods. If you just want to blat a string input with everything that you can arrange, uh, but asking an automated test setup to tell you what value a, a product is for a user is a is a lot harder. Uh, that's not to say I don't agree we shouldn't be automating more, um, but what you should view is that automation is not a direct replacement for manual testers. They each have their own individual responsibilities and they should be aware of those. Um, but so, yeah, encourage your manual testers to learn automated principles. It's very important that they understand what's going on on the other side of their team. Um, so yeah, less automate all the things and more automate more the things. So if you want to share that, I'm trying to meme that one because that's more important for us. Um, and the last little bit of advice I would give is to say, uh, regardless of who it is in your team, whether it's a developer, a UX designer, product manager, tester, um, really encourage them to pursue their outside activities because you never know, one day they might be able to take an element of that into their work as well. Thank you very much. Now, before I open up the floor to questions, uh, who would like to hear one more song on the loop station? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, there we go. Right, I'm just going to put some headphones in because I can't actually hear it from the app down there, which is quite hard when you have the loop. Um, right. Thank you very much, guys.